Okay, uh, here we are in question one. The times taken by 120 children to complete a particular puzzle are represented in a cumulative frequency graph. Use the graph to estimate the interquartile range of the data. Well, um, uh, basically what we want to do for the interquartile range is we want to take the, the upper quarter, which I'll call Q3, and the lower quarter, which we call Q1, and uh, find the difference between them, right? So the difference between the upper quarter and the lower quarter. How do we get the upper quarter? Well, it is uh, basically three quarters of uh, away along the data. So um, typically we take the, the three quarters of m plus one value. Um, but, you know, we've got 120 here, so we can just take three quarters of 120. And um, if we do that, what we're going to get is we're going to get 90. So we're looking at the 90th value. 90th value. And for the lower quarter, what we're looking at is the, the quarter value. So that's going to be the 30th value, because we do 120 divided by 4. And um, so we just got to really read this off on the graph. So 90 is here. Um, and that looks to me like it's 31, but it's, it's kind of hard for me to see on this, um, you know, with using the tablet and everything. And 30, let's try to read that guy off. And I think that's what, 24, something like that. Yeah, 24. Okay, and so therefore the interquartile range is uh, going to be 31 minus 24, which I get to be 7. Now I'm just going to check the mark scheme, see what they accept. Mark scheme, let's go up. Uh, they go for 7.3, so they will accept an up upper quartile anywhere between 30.5 and 31.25, all right, so I'm just inside there, and they will accept a lower quartile between 23.25 and 24, yes, yeah, so I was very close uh, there, and uh, yeah, interquartile range between 7 and 7.5, okay? Uh, now, hopefully, of course, because you're, you're doing it on paper, uh, yours should be much, much closer to the mark than mine. Just just be extra careful as you're drawing it. Make sure, you, you know, you've got a, your rulers properly aligned and everything. It'd be really irritating just to lose those two marks uh, through, through carelessness, okay? All right, then here we are in part B. 35% of children took longer than T seconds to complete the puzzle. Use the graph to estimate the value of T. Well, if 35% of children took longer than T seconds, then 65% of children uh, took less than took less than T seconds. Okay, so I think that's one thing you just need to be uh, on the lookout for, right? Um, uh, Thirty-five percent of children took longer than T, so they were they were greater than T. Uh, we want to be looking to the left, so we want to find the sixty-five percent uh, took less than T seconds. So if we go back up to the graph, uh, first of all, what we want to do is we want to find the uh, um, uh, sixty-five percent of uh, one hundred and twenty. So sixty-five percent of one hundred and twenty is 78, right? So we're kind of looking for the, the 78th value. Let's go up. Oh, sorry about that. Let's go up. And uh, it's going to be a bit difficult with my zoomed in graph, but it's going to look something like that, I guess. It's going to come down. So I think that's something like tw between 27 and 28. So, um, I don't know, T is equal to 27.5. I'll just look at the mark scheme, see what value they've got, because uh, obviously you can do it more accurately on, on paper. Uh, they've gone for any answer between 28 and 29. Okay, so yeah, it's a bit difficult for me on the screen to do it. They'll accept any answer between 28 and 29, but that's the way that you should do it, um, is to just is just read it off the graph in the way that I've done, okay? Okay, so this is question two. Hazim repeatedly throws two ordinary fair six-sided die at the same time. On each occasion, the score is the sum of the two numbers that she obtains. Find the probability that it takes exactly five throws of the two dice for Hazim to obtain a score of eight or more. Well, I think it's just easier just to draw a quick probability table here. I've um, got the outcomes of one die here and the outcome of the other die here. And of course, we just add up the scores. Now, what are we interested in? We're basically interested in this part here, right? Because we want a score of eight or higher. So how many ways can we get that? Well, it's uh, five ways plus four ways plus three ways plus two ways plus one way. 
And then there are 36 uh, possible outcomes in total. So if we find out the probability of being greater than eight, then that's going to be equal to one plus two plus three plus four plus five all divided through by 36. And that's equal to 15 36 and 15 36 is the same as 5 upon 12. Okay, now then, I think it's always helpful to define our uh, distribution. So the way I'm going to do that is to say, let x be the number of tries until the score is greater than 6. So until score greater, so not greater than six, greater than eight. Okay. Um, now then, what do we want? We want to find the probability that it takes exactly five throws of the dice to obtain a score of eight or more. Well, um, I think it's just easier just to draw it out, right? We could either have a success or failure. So the failure here means I don't get a score greater than eight. Success or failure. Success or failure. Success or failure and then success or failure. Now, the reason I've drawn it out like this is because uh, this particular outcome here represents getting a score of eight or more in exactly five throws. Okay, can you see that? Because first throw, I didn't get it. Second throw, I didn't get it. Third throw, I didn't get it. Fourth throw, I didn't get it. But on the fifth throw, I did, right? So in other words, I want four consecutive failures and then a success. Well, um, what's the probability of that going to be? Well, remember that the probability of success was five twelfths. So um, that would be the success at the end, five twelfths. And what would be the uh, probability of failure? Well, probability of failure would be seven twelfths. And how many of those failures do I need? Well, I need four of them. Okay, so the probability is going to be seven twelfths to the power of four times by five twelfths. And if I um, put that into my calculator, I get uh, 12,005 divided through by 248832, uh, which is the same as 0 0.0482. Okay. Okay, here we are in part B. Find the probability it takes no more than four throws of the two dice for Hazim to obtain a score of eight or more. Now on this diagram, I've got S and F. Um, that refers to success and failure. And success is that we get a score of more than eight, uh, uh, or eight or more rather, on each trial. And, and failure is that we don't get that. Now, um, if we want to find the probability it takes no more than four throws, then basically we can have everything except having four consecutive failures, right? Because if we've got four consecutive failures, then it means that it's going to take more than four throws to eventually get a success, okay? So basically, we can have everything apart from this path here. Um, now, what's the probability of each, uh, each failure? Uh, we saw that that was equal to seven twelfths. So four consecutive failures is going to be seven twelfths to the power of four, and that's the thing that we cannot have. So the probability is going to be one minus the seven twelfths to the power of four. And uh, if I stick that into my calculator, I get 0 0.884. Okay, and that's my answer. All right, then part C, uh, for eight randomly chosen throws of the two dice, find the probability that Hazim obtains a score on of eight or more on fewer than three occasions. Now, there's a bit of a trick here, isn't it? Because what they've done is they've actually changed the distribution, right? This is really a binomial question. And I think it's helpful always to be defining our, uh, our random variable. So in this case, we've got a new random variable. We're going to get let, let y be the number of throws with a score of eight or above. Sorry, with a score greater than or equal to eight. Okay. Um, now, if that's the case, then y is going to be distributed binomially uh, with eight trials, right? Because we're throwing this thing uh, eight times and with a probability of success of five upon 12, right? Because in the previous part of the question, we saw that the probability of getting a score of eight or more was five twelfths. 
So just to be clear, what we've now got is we've got a new variable, right? Um, because in the previous questions, the random variable was the, the number of throws until we get eight or more. Um, but this one is, uh, the random var variable is the number of throws where we get a score of eight or more, right? So it's not how many attempts do we have to have until we get this. It's, no, if we run the, uh, the experiment eight times or 10 times or 12 times, how many of those times uh, will have a score of greater than eight? So it's, it's, a, it's a slightly different thing. Now, um, what are we asked to find? We're asked to find the probability that you obtain uh, this score on fewer than three occasions, okay? So in other words, we are being asked to find the probability that y is less than or equal to two, right? Because uh, fewer than three, I'll just make it super clear, fewer than three is the same as the probability that y is less than or equal to two. Now, if we do this, um, we need to remember that y could be zero or y could be one or y could be two. So we've got to then calculate each of these probabilities and then add them up. Now, how do we calculate a binomial probability? Well, if uh, the probability y is equal to zero, we're going to get eight C zero, uh, five twelfths to the power of zero times by seven twelfths to the power of uh, eight. Now, what does that mean? This is like the probability of success, right? But we've got no successes, so it's to the power of zero. And if we've had zero successes in eight trials, then we must have had eight failures. So that's seven twelfths there is the probability of failure, all to the power of eight. And eight C zero represents the number of different ways in which this outcome could have occurred. Well, it's the same as one, because there's only one way that you can get eight failures. You just, you just get the eight failures. Uh, the next one here is going to be eight C one. Uh, probability of success to the power of one, because we've got one success. The probability of failure to the power of seven, right? Because we have one success, we've got seven failures. And what does that 8C1 represent? Well, it means that there are eight different ways in which we could get one success and seven failures, right? You imagine that we get success and failure, 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 or failure, success, failure, 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 or failure, failure, success, and, and so on and so on. Okay, next one, uh, just use the same formula, 8C2. Uh, 5 twelfths to the power of 2, you've got two successes, and 7 twelfths to the power of 6, because two successes means we've had six failures. If I type all of that into the calculator, type, 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 I suggest you do each term uh, separately, uh, what you get is 0 0.282. Okay, so a little bit of patience there, um, but I think the key thing is you uh, always want to be in the habit, basically, of stating your random variable stating your distribution. I think if you're clear about that, then you are usually able to, to do the question. So get into that habit, guys. I think it'd be really helpful. Okay, then question three, a farmer sells eggs. The weight in grams of the eggs can be modeled as a normal distribution with mean 80.5, standard deviation 6.6. .6. Eggs are classified as small, medium, or large according to their weight. A small egg weighs less than 76 grams, and 40% of the eggs are classified as medium. Find the percentage of eggs that are classified as small. Well, as I said in the previous question, I think it's helpful to define our distribution. So we're going to say, let x be the weight of an egg of an egg. So we're told, therefore, that x is normally distributed uh, with a mean of 80.5 and with a variance of 6.6 .6 squared, right? Because it's standard deviation squared. Um, now, an egg is small if it weighs less than 76 grams. So what we want to do is we want to find the probability that X is less than 76, okay? And uh, we can convert this to the Z distribution by saying that uh, z is equal to x minus mu upon sigma. So we take our 76, we subtract the mean 80.5, and we divide through by 6.6. .6. And uh, if we do that, we get the probability that z is less than uh, negative 0 0.6818. Okay. 
Uh, now then, um, this is a bit tricky because our table of data for the Z distribution, like the one that you've got in your exams, doesn't take negative values. So how are we going to deal with this? Well, I think the best way is always to draw a diagram, right? You want to be in the habit of doing this and it doesn't take too much time. So here's what the Z distribution looks like. Okay, it is uh, symmetrical about the y-axis because the mean is uh, supposed to be zero like that. And... Um, if we're trying to find the probability that Z is less than 0.681, then what we're being asked to find is something like this. So here is negative 0.68818, sorry. Uh, we're being asked to find that region there, okay? Now, via symmetry, hopefully what we can see is that that should be the same as finding this region here. Sorry, my... my my normal distribution has not been drawn very symmetrically. I hope you appreciate that. But that's the basic idea, right? In other words, uh, these two areas here are the same because the graph is symmetrical. So what we can do is we can say, all right, the probability that we are less than negative 0.6818 is the same as the probability that Z is going to be greater than positive 0 0.6, funny looking six, 0 0.6818. Well, um, that's also annoying because the uh, Z distribution tables don't tell us the probability that we're greater than a certain value. It only tells us the probability that we are less. So what we want to find in the question is actually this region here, right? all of that region, right? everything to the left. So that is the same as doing, therefore, 1 minus the probability that Z is less than 0.68. One eight. So let me just try to try to explain that again because I think I fumbled my words. We want to find the probability that we are in the blue bit there, so that we're greater than zero point six eight one eight that region. And the way we find that is we do one minus this whole green region here, right, which is the region um, that is less than zero point six eight one eight. And the reason we do that is because the tables only give us the data for that green region. So if we do this, all we're going to get is uh, I need to go to the diagram, don't I? 0 0.6818. So let's go over here. So actually find the value. So let me get it. 0 0.6. It's that. 0 0.68, which is that. So we're looking at that value there, which is 0 0.7517. And we want um, 2, don't we, basically there. So I'm going to add that, that 7 there. So 0 0.7517 plus the little 7 on the end is going to be 0 0.7524. 0 0.7524. So 1 minus 0 0.7524. And if I do that uh, on my calculator, I'm going to get 0 0.2476, uh, which is 24.8%. Okay, 24%. 0.8%. And that should be my answer. Okay, here we are in part B. We want to find the least possible weight of an egg that's classified as large. Um, well, I think the, the best way to do this is to try to visualize what's going on. Um, our, our eggs are normally distributed. Sorry, that's a terrible normal distribution. Let's try to do that a bit better. There we go. Nice normal distribution. And uh, we were told in the question that this has a uh, mean of 80.5. OK, um, but also this distribution was split into three regions, that is small, medium and large. Now, the, the small region was all the eggs that were less than 76. Right. So whatever that was there, 76 grams. And we found that the probability of being in that particular region was 24.8 uh, percent or uh, 0 0.2476, right? So that was the probability that you were in that region there. I'll just shade that in. And if we read the question carefully, we know that 60%, uh, not 6%, sorry, 40% of the eggs are classified as medium. So there's going to be another region, which takes us, let's say, up to here, which is going to be for the medium size eggs, and that's going to have a probability of 0 0.4, okay? So that's that guy there. All right, all of that, all of that, all of that. And so where are the large eggs going to be? Uh, the large eggs are going to be everything to the right. Okay, this is where the large eggs are going to be. Now then, 
how would we find this particular value, which kind of cuts off where the large eggs are? Well, um, essentially, it's going to be the, uh, the value where the probability of being less than that is going to be equal to 0 0.4 plus 0.2476. In other words, if we add up the probability of being small and we add up the probability of being medium, um, we know that this value here, the cutoff for the large, uh, the probability of being less than that must be those two things added up. Okay, so we can say that. So just clarify. The probability that x is less than l right, where L defines the large egg, has got to be equal to 0 0.4 plus 0 0.2476, which is 0 0.6476. So what we want to do is we want to find the z value that corresponds with a probability of 0 0.6476. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over here and see if we can find it, 6476. Let's see if we can find that. 0 0.6480 is probably the closest value we can get. It's that value there. So let me just highlight that for you. Okay, that value there. And that is uh, a Z value of 0 0.38. Yeah, I think it's the closest we can get. So the Z value that gives us this. Ooh is equal to 0 0.38 and so what we want to do is we just want to find the um the x value that corresponds with that z value well we know that z is equal to x minus mu upon sigma and so we can just rearrange this to get x is equal to z sigma plus mu so what we're going to do there is we will do 0 0.38 times by the sigma value, which was um, 6.6. .6. So times by 6.6. .6. We're going to add the mean, which was 80.5. And if we do that, we get 83.008. So 83.008. And so I think we can just say uh, 83 grams is going to be the value at which we, we classify eggs as large. Okay, this is part C. 150 of the eggs for sale last week were weighed. Use an approximation to find the probability that more than 68 of these eggs were classified as a medium. Okay, um, now this is, uh, again, another uh, thing similar, to, I think, to the previous question where there is a change in the distribution. And uh, it's helpful if we can define our distributions nice and clearly uh, so that we can identify this. So in this particular case, we're going to, we call a new random variable y, and the random variable y is going to be the number of eggs that were classified as medium, that were medium, okay? And if uh, this is the case, then hopefully we can see that y is actually a binomial distribution where we've got 150 trials because we've got 150 particular eggs, and the probability of success for each trial is uh, is going to be 0 0.4 uh, because in the question we uh, we read at the very beginning that 40% of the eggs have uh, uh, are classified as medium. Okay. Now, if this is the case, then what we're being asked to find is the probability that more than 68 of these eggs are going to be classified as medium. Now, hopefully what you're going to notice is that that's going to be very, very tedious to, to sit and work out because you'd have to find the probability that an egg is 69 or, 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 uh, or uh, uh, sorry, that there are 69 eggs or 70 eggs or 71 or 72. Um, and so that's going to take a lot of time. So what we need to do is we need to do an approximation with the normal distribution. So we are going to say now that y can actually be considered as normally distributed. And uh, if we do that, then we should understand that the mean of that normal distribution is going to be equal to NP, and the variance of that normal distribution will be equal to NPQ. So in other words, to find the mean, we're going to need to do 150 times by 0 0.4, and to find the uh, variance, we need to do 150 times by 0 0.4 times by 0 0.6. And if we do that, what we're going to get is 60, 36, but it's 
probably a bit more helpful to write that variance as six squared because we want to remind ourselves that the standard deviation is six. So we're trying to now find the probability that y is greater than 68. Um, but I think it might be better to write this as y is greater than or equal to 69 because we're going to have to use the continuity correction. What we've done is we've gone from a discrete distribution to a continuous distribution. And so um, if we imagine that on a line, let's say we go over here, so we've got a straight line here. Here's 68. Here's 69. If we want to find the probability that we're greater than or equal to 69, then actually what that involves is going from here, 68.5, all the way to the right. Okay, so we sort of like consider uh, each of these integer values as going uh, uh, half the way to the left and half the way to the right there. Okay, so what we're really doing now is we are finding the probability that y is greater than or equal to 68.5. And then uh, to do that, we just do our, our usual normal distribution stuff. We find the probability that uh, z is greater than or equal to 68.5 minus the mean value, which was 60, over the standard deviation, which is 6. And if you key all of that into your calculator, you get the probability that z is greater than or equal to 1.4167. Now remember the table of data doesn't give you the probability you're greater than a value, it gives you the probability that you're less than a value. And so the way we can uh, get around that is say we're going to consider 1 minus the probability that z is less than 1.4167. Okay, so that's the value that we want to look up on our table of data, 1.4167. So let's just go have a look at this. So we've got 1.4. Uh, here, let's just key that on, 1.4, 1.41, we want 1.417 there, so that's, uh, we've got to add 10 on to the end, so that's going to be a probability of 0 0.9217, so let's go down there, so this guy is going to be 0 0.9217, so if we well, then to subtract that off, what we get is 0 0.0783, and that should be our answer for this question. Okay, question four. The times to the nearest minute of 150 athletes taking part in a charity run are recorded. The results are summarized in the table. Um, we want to draw a histogram to represent this information. Now, the key thing about a histogram is to understand that the frequency is represented by the area of each bar, right? So it's not represented by the height of each bar, it's represented by the area of each bar. Uh, so what we want to do is we uh, want to find the width of each of those little, little class boundaries, right? These guys here, see how big they are, and then do the frequency divided by that width because that's going to tell us uh, the right height that we want uh, to get. Now, um, I don't like the way they, they lay out the data, so I'm, I'm just going to change it a tiny bit. Uh, I'm going to kind of write it out as a column. So let me just get this. Okay. So we've got the, uh, the class here. Ooh. Okay, so I'm going to try to draw out a bit like that. Uh, let me explain as I'm, as I'm going along. So we have got the time. Now, the, th the thing about this, right, if you go up and look at the, look at the data, uh, what's happened is that the time has been rounded to the nearest minute. So this actually doesn't represent 101 to 120. It really represents 100 0.5 to 120.5. So I think we, we need to indicate that on so that the time is between um, 100.5. Let's move that a little bit. So 100.5 uh, all the way up to 120.5. Okay, have I got that right? 
Yeah. And uh, we need to do the same with, with all of the other ones. Now, I'm going to admit the greater than or equal than signs uh, just to make things look a little bit neater. Uh, so the next one is going to be 120.5 all the way up to 130.5. And then we're going to have uh, 130.5 all the way up to 135.5. Okay. And 135.5 all the way up to 145.5 and then 145.5 all the way up to 160.5 okay and uh, then what we're going to need to do i'll just change that as well so it does this all, all, all matches let's get rid of that uh, then what I'm going to do is I want to find the class width of each of these boxes. So I need to do the top boundary minus the bottom boundary. And if I do that, I'm going to get 120.5 minus 100.5 is, is 20. And then for this one, it'll be 10 and then 5 and then 10 and 15. And I'll copy out what my uh, frequency uh, frequencies were. So my frequencies were 18, 48, 34. So 18, 48 and 34 and then what were the other two 32 and 18 right 32 and 18 so therefore the frequency density which is the same thing as the height of my histogram is going to be the frequency right it's going to be these terms divided by their respective class widths okay and if i do that for example if i do um, 18 divided by 20 i get 0 0.9 and then 48 divided by 10 is 4.8 and 34 divided by 5 is 6.8, 32 divided by 10 is 3.2, and uh, 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 18 divided by 15 is 1.2, okay? All right then, um, what do I need to do next? I want to draw this out on a histogram. Well, how am I going to do that? Well, I, I'm going to need a graph that uh, goes from 100.5 all the way up to 160, so let's, let's have a look at the chart that we've given you says so that if that's a hundred so this guy here 110 120 130 140 150 160 yeah so i'll probably make make that guy there 100 i think that would make sense and i want to go all the way up to a maximum frequency density of 6.8 so i want to go 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 yeah that would make sense so let's try to um, draw this on, make a nice, right, nice diagram like that. Better use a different color other than white. I think I'll use blue. Okay. It's not very good, is it? Let me try that one more time. Okay, like that. Okay. Like that. Like that. Uh, so the axis on the right is time. So we want to label that axis. Is always a mark for labeling axes, by the way. Please, please, please don't throw away that mark. And then the axis, uh, the y-axis is the frequency density. Okay, so frequency density. You must write density. All right, and I'm going to label it. So that's uh, one, two, three, four, five, six and seven and uh this was a hundred 110 120 130 140 150 160 now it's going to be hard for me to do this um with the tablet and you know without zooming in lots um but you want to make sure you get your boundaries right so uh, it needs to be clear that you're drawing from 100.5 to 120.5 now um, uh, please excuse me I, i'm not really able to do that um on on the screen for you so um uh, just bear with me but listen to what i say you, you need to make sure you've indicated that really clearly on your diagram uh that those are the boundaries okay so uh we want a, a frequency density of 0 0.9 between there and and basically there and then of 4.8 between 120 and 130 so 4.8 is like there so that's that and then a density of 6.8 between 130 and 135 so 6.8 is like there Okay, and then uh, 3.2 between 135 and there we go, 145 was it? Yeah, like, like that. And then 
between 145 and 160, we want 1.2, something like that. Okay, now I'll just, uh, I'll just connect these up. Okay, like that, that, okay. Okay, and that should be my histogram. Again, um, yours will need to be a little bit better, uh, but that's that's the basic idea. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna check the mark scheme. I'm gonna read it out to you just to make sure that you are getting all of those um, those marks that you should be. So let me just open that. So go down. Right, okay. Um, so A1 mark, all the bar heights are correct on the graph. Uh, no follow through, by the way. So if you got it, if you got it wrong in um, uh, for the working for getting the the frequency densities, then you're going to lose that mark as well. Um, and using a suitable linear scale scale with at least three values indicated, no lower than uh, one centimeter uh, is equal to one frequency density. Right. So it needs to be a reasonable scale. Uh, I think the one I've used is uh, is appropriate and um, uh, hopefully the one that most people will use. Okay, B1 mark, the bar ends at 120.5, 130.5, 135.5, and so on and so forth. The bars are drawn with a horizontal linear scale with at least three values indicated. The horizontal scale must be between 100 and 160. Okay, that whole point about the bars need to end at 120.5, 130.5. Just make sure that you do indicate that. And if need be, just write it onto your graph. Make sure you don't lose that mark. Uh, final B, B1 mark is the axis labeled frequency density time and uh, and minutes. You, sorry, you need to also include the, uh, the, the, uh, the minutes there. Uh, or an appropriate title. So let me just right there. I would have lost the mark, I think. And the reason is I didn't include there the scale minutes. Okay, so again, just be super careful. It'd be really irritating to do so much work and then lose marks uh, just for things like that. Okay. All right, then uh, we're in part B of this question. We want to calculate the estimate for the mean and standard deviation of the times taken by the athletes. Now, um, when we're calculating the mean from this kind of data, um, we've got to take into account the fact that we, we don't actually know where um, our, our data lies in any particular band. So, for example, we've got 18 people who are in this band, but we don't know where they are, right? They could be 103, or they could be 117, or you know, one could be 112, the other could be 106. We don't actually know where each of the individual um, uh, people are. So what we've got to do, if we want to calculate the mean, is we've got to calculate uh, where the center of this uh, band is, and for each of the bands, because we're going to assume that everybody in that band is, is at the center, right? Um, so that's our, going to be our first job. Our first job is to, is to calculate the kind of the center of each of these bands. Now, the way we're going to do that um, is we're basically finding the midpoint. And the midpoint is we add up the, the two values and divide by two. So we add up 100.5 and 120.5, and we divide through by two. So we'll calculate the midpoints that way, right? So uh, if we do that, then I'm going to get 110.5. If I add up 120.5 and 130.5, I get 125.5. And uh, this one will be 133, this one will be 140.5, and this one will be 153, okay? All right then, so these are like our X values, if, if you prefer, but they're kind of um, X values that, that, that take into account uh, the middle of, of the band. So how are we going to use this to calculate the mean? Well, the mean X bar is equal to sigma FX over sigma f. In other words, what are we doing? Uh, we are multiplying each of these midpoints by its frequency. So 110.5 times by 18, 125.5 times by 48, and so on and so on and so on. And we are going to add them all up. And then what we're going to do is we're going to divide through by the total number of people, which I think was 150, wasn't it, in the, in the previous question? Then might not go back and check that in a moment. So we are going to do uh, 18 times by 110.5 uh, plus 48 times by 125.5 uh, plus 
uh, 34 times 133. Okay, uh, plus, what was it? 32 times by 140.5. And then uh, 18 times by 153. Okay, it's quite a lot of quite a lot of data there. Sorry about that. And then uh, we have got to divide that through by the uh, total number of people. Let me just uh, remind myself how many people uh, that was, just to make sure I'm not making a mistake. 150 athletes. All right, so we've got to take that. Got to divide it all by 150. Whoop, sorry about that. 150. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we've got to key that all into a calculator. Uh, if we key that all into a calculator, then what we should get is 131.9. Okay, so that's going to be our, our mean. All right, then the, the uh, next thing that we need to ask is the, uh, is the variance, okay, uh, or the standard deviation. Now, how do we calculate the, the, the variance or the standard deviation? Or the variance, the formula for that is uh, the sum of the squares over n, or you could think of it the mean of the, the squares, uh, minus the mean squared. So minus our x bar value squared. What, what does that actually mean? It means we, we take all of our, our values for the, for the time, which are these things here, okay? Uh, we square them and we uh, um, uh, multiply each by the frequency okay and add them all up right so so the 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 sigma x squared there is perhaps a bit more appropriate to say uh, sigma f x squared because um kind of what we're saying is yeah we got our midpoint value here 110.5 but we're going to square that we've got to remember we've got that 18 times right so it's 110.5 squared plus 110.5 squared plus 110.5 squared 18 times okay now again i think a, a, a useful thing to do is uh, we want to uh, include the kind of uh, the squares uh, here but i'm just going to skip that out if you don't mind and what i would do is i'll write this out in full so we are going to get so our f was here 18. So we're going to get 18 times by 110.5 squared plus 48 times by 125.5 squared plus 34. Sorry about all the scrolling. I hope it's not making you dizzy. Uh, times by 133 squared plus uh, 32 times by 140.5 squared. It was 32, wasn't it? So 32 times by 140.5 all squared. And then plus the 18 times by 153 all squared. So we're going to do all of that. Then having done that, I'm going to zoom out because it's so much, isn't it? Uh, we are then going to have to divide that through by the total amount of data, which is 150. So just, just to clarify, this guy here, everything I've written there is that guy there. Okay. And then from that, we've got to subtract the mean squared. So we've got to take our previous answer, 131.9, square it and subtract it off. So we are minusing 131.9 squared okay now all of that is basically uh calculator work guys i'm sorry it's a bit boring but you just got to key it in i suggest you do it two or three times to make sure you get your answer right if you do it you should get there 137.5 but you need to remember that this is the formula for the variance right it's the formula for sigma squared so you need to square root it in order to get the standard deviation which is 11.7 okay so um I hope that should be okay. You're given the formulas anyway in the uh, formula sheet. Uh, so you just got to make sure you're extra careful. Um, and uh, yeah, I suggest with all these calculation things, just calculate them two to three times. Just make sure you get the same answer. It's so easy uh, to go wrong. Okay, question five. A red spinner has four sides, label one, two, three, four. When the spinner is spun, 
The score is the number on the side on which it lands. The random variable x denotes this score. The probability distribution table for x is given below. We want to show that the probability is equal to 0 0.12. Well, um, there's only one mark question because it should be quite straightforward. The sum of all probabilities must be equal to 1, right? And the reason for that is um, 1 represents uh, certainty, right? Like everything that can happen. So if you add up all of these events, these represent everything that can happen. Uh, so if you add them all up, it must be equal to 1, okay? So if I do that, then I'm going to get 0 0.28 plus p plus 2p uh, plus 3p is equal to 1, which means that 6p is equal to 0 0.72. Now divide both sides by 6. I get p is equal to 0 0.12. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, then. Um, part B. Uh, a fair blue spinner and a fair green spinner, right? The word fair means that, that all the outcomes are going to have equal probability. Uh, each have four sides over one, two, three, four. All three spinners, red, blue, and green, are spun at the same time. Find the probability that the sum of the three scores is four or less. Well, I think to do this, best thing is just to draw a table, I think. So let me uh, let me try to do that. So we could either be uh, red, blue, or green. Now, um, how can we get a sum of four or less? Well, we could have one, one, and one, because that would give us a sum of three. Or we could have one, one, and two, because that would give us a sum of four. We could have one, two, and one. Uh, or we could have uh, two, one, and one. Now, we need to be careful about this, because we just need to think about what, what's the probability for, for each outcome. Well, the, the, the probability for the blue and the green um, is is going to be the same, right? So each each outcome for the blue is going to be a quarter, and each outcome for the green is is going to be a quarter because these are these are fair spinners. So the blue and the green together is going to have a probability of a quarter squared, right? A quarter squared, a quarter squared, and a quarter squared. Um, but the red is the one that uh, isn't fair, right? So remember, we go up. The probability of uh, getting a 1 is 0 0.28, so 28 upon 100. And the probability of getting a 2 is 0 0.12, so 12 upon 100, right? So uh, these, the first three are going to be uh, 0 0.28, 0 0.28, 0 0.28, 0 0.28, 0 0.28, 0 0.28, and then the last one is going to be 0 0.12, right? So we've got to multiply all these guys out, okay? And then having multiplied them all out, what we need to do is then we need to add them up um, because these represent the four distinct cases. So if I do that, um, it's basically like doing 0 0.28 um, uh, times by three, right? Because so we've got three lots of 0 0.28 plus 0 0.12, and then uh, all times through by uh, 1 16th. So divide by 16 gives me 0 0.06 there, all right? So that outcome is 0. 0, 06. If, if, if you're really not sure what I've done there, by the way, you can just multiply these out individually and then um, uh, add them up. But what I'm saying is I've got like 0 0.28 lots of a 16th, zero, another 0 0.28 lots of a 16th, another 0 0.28 lots of a 16th, and then 0 0.12 lots of a 16th. So I just did 0 0.28 times by 3 plus 0 0.12, and then what it is, I times it all by 1 upon 16, and that gave me my answer. Now I'm just going to uh, double check it, make sure I got it right. Yeah, 0 0.06 is the answer. Okay, then uh, here we are in part C of this question. We want to find the probability that the product of the three scores is four or less given that X is odd. Now, I think that given there is the thing that makes this hard. Uh, and so what I would do is I would try to um, clarify everything by writing out the events nice and clearly. So I'm going to define the first event A as being that the product of the three scores is four or less. Okay, that's event A. And um, the event B is going to be that X is odd. Okay, so I've, I've clarified these as two separate events here, right? This guy here is event um, A, A, and this guy here is event B. Why have I done that? Well, because what we're being asked in the question is to find the probability of A given B, right? The probability that the product is four or less given that B is odd. And you should know, hopefully, that this is the same thing as the probability of A intersection B, right? A and B together at the same time, divided through by the probability of B. 
Now, once I've done that, um, that helps me because it clarifies things uh, quite nicely because it's saying that what I need to do is I need to find the probability of both events happening at the same time, the intersection. I want to find the probability of just B happening. And then my answer is going to be the division of those two, right? So we're going to focus here first. We want to find the probability of A uh, and B together. And I think the best way of doing that is to draw a table. Um, so we're going to have the red spinner, the blue spinner, and the green spinner. Now, remember, the red has got to be odd. And so uh, that can only be one or three, okay? So um, let's start off. Uh, we could have one, one, and one. And uh, basically what I'm going to consider is all the options where red is one to start with. And so if I want a product of um, uh, four or less, uh, then actually we just want blue and green to uh, have a product of, uh, of four and less, right? So uh, that could be um, done with red, uh, blue and green being one and one, or it could be done with blue and green being one and two or blue and green being two and one, or it could be with them being two and two, right? Uh, and then another alternative would be, this would be uh, one and three. And another alternative would be, that would be three and one. But of course we can't have three and two because that would be uh, uh, greater than four. And uh, of course we could have one where these are four, right? So uh, four and one uh, or one and four. Okay, and then uh, I think that covers all the options where uh, where red is one. And so now what we've got to do is we consider where red is um, uh, is is three. Uh, well, then there's only going to be one option for that. The other two have got to be one and one um, because uh, if we put a two here, for example, the product's going to be six, and that's that's too great. Now then, as we discussed in the previous question, each of these um, uh, red and blue options, right? All of these guys. Uh, each outcome's got the probability of a quarter, so all of these have got a probability of a quarter. Okay, so uh, for, for each of these events, what we've got is we've got a quarter times by a quarter, and that's the, the probability of, of the blue and, and the green. So the only thing that really matters is the red. And for the red, what we've got is if it's one, we've got a probability of 0 0.28, okay, or 28 upon 100. So, okay, so that'll be there, 28 upon 100. And so basically that's going to be repeated, isn't it? So how many how many events have we got with a similar probability? We've got one event, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight events, I think. Yeah, like that. So that probability is just going to be repeated eight times. So we're going to times it by eight. And then at the bottom, what do we got? We got this guy here uh, where the red is three. So what was the probability of red being three? Um, that was two times by P wasn't it? So that was uh, 0 0.24 or 24 upon 100. So that guy is going to be uh, 24 upon 100 uh, uh, times by a quarter times by a quarter. Okay, so basically I've got this probability but eight times and then this probability once. So then what I'm going to have to do is I'm, I'm going to have to add that to that. So if I was to add these guys, what answer do I get? So 0 0.28 uh, divided by 4 divided by 4 and times by 8 is 0 0.14. So that guy there is 0 0.14. Okay. And then I've got uh, 0 0.24 times uh, times by a quarter. So divide by 4, then divide by 4. That's 0 0.015, 0 0.015. And so, of course, if I add those guys up, I get 0 0.155, so 0 0.155, okay? So that for me is the probability of A intersection B. So let me just write that there, uh, 0 0.155. And then we need to divide that by the probability of B. Well, the probability of B is just that um, that is odd, isn't it? So um, how do I get an odd answer for, for red? I've either got 0 0.28 here, or I've got 0 0.24 here. So 0 0.28 plus 0 0.24 is 0 0.52. So that should be 0 0.52 on the bottom. And therefore, if I do 0 0.155 divided by 0 0.52, I get 0 0.298. So 0 0.298. And I think probably what I should do is just check the mark scheme, see if I've got that um, right. 0 0.298 is, um, is, is an acceptable answer, as well as the fraction 155 upon 520. 
um, if you were to, to you know, uh, uh, oh yeah, <laughs> if, if you just times everything through by a, uh, by a thousand, right, that'd be 155 over 520, right? That fraction would also be acceptable. Okay, I hope that was clear. If you're finding these videos helpful, by the way, uh, please like and subscribe. Please share with your friends and comment uh, below if you've got any particular questions. Okay, here we are in question six, which is a permutations combination style question. Now, uh, if you hate these questions right now, um, trust me, I hate them too. I hated them as a student and I still hate them <laughs> to this very day. But I think the key to being able to do them is to be nice and systematic and to try to think th things through clearly. So um, let's read the question very carefully. In a restaurant, the tables are rectangular. Each table seats four people, two along each of the longer sides of the table. Now, eight friends have booked two tables, X and Y. Uh, Rajid, Sue, and Tan are three of these um, ethnically diverse friends. <laughs> they always seem to be ethnically diverse in these questions. Um, okay, part A. The eight friends will be divided into two groups of four, one group for table X and one group for table Y. Find the number of ways in which this can be done if Rajid and Sue must sit at the same table as each other and Tan must sit at the other table. Oh no, it seems like there's been, um, there's been some relational strife uh, between these three. Okay, now first things first. We're dividing them into two groups. We're not actually seating them at the table in this part of the question. Now, because we're not seating them at the table, the order in which we put them doesn't matter, right? It's not like we're saying, let's put Rajid here and let's put Sue here and let's put two of the other friends here. Um, all we're saying is we're just gonna divide them up into two groups and we're gonna uh, put one on one table and one on the other. Now, in that sense, the order does matter because we're not just saying let's divide into two groups. We're saying let's divide into two groups and we're gonna put Rajid and Sue perhaps on this table, or we could be putting Rajid and Sue on that table, right? So there's, even though we've divided them into two groups, the order in which those two groups are allocated to the tables um, does matter. Okay, so let, let, let's, try to, let's try to think about it. Um, let's say we've got table X. Okay, so this is table X, and here we've got table Y. And if we put Rajid and Sue on table X, then what that means is we need to choose two other people to go onto that table, right? Now, we know that Tan has got to be on table Y, so that means that we, we don't have eight people to choose from anymore. What we've got is we've actually got five people to choose from because we, we, we can't have Rajid and Sue and we can't have Tan. So we've got five people to choose from. We want to choose two remaining people to go on table X. So the number of ways we can choose those people is going to be 5C2. Remember, we're using combinations there because the order in which we select those people is not important. Then for table Y, right, well, we've only got three people um, left remaining, and we've got to choose three. Uh, so that's going to be 3C3. And if you think about it, that's just one, isn't it? Because once you've chosen the guys that go here, um, then um, you've already automatically chosen the guys that go here, right? So, so this particular option, which I'll call option one, uh, the number of ways you can do it is going to be 5C2 times by 3C3. Okay, now we've also got a second option to consider, right? Where Rajid and Sue are on table Y and Tan is on um, table X. Well, actually, this is just the same thing, but in, in reverse, isn't it, right? So if we were to choose then the people who go on table Y, well, we've got five C2 people to choose from. And then for table X, we've got three C3 people um, to choose. And so again, this is just going to be five C2 times by. 3C3. So in other words, we, we've, we've got this thing, 5C2 times 3C3, twice, right? So we times it by two. So that's what's, uh, that's what's going on there. Another way you can think about it is we've actually got these two groups here, this group and that group. And then how many ways can we rearrange them? We can rearrange them two ways, right? Either, either this guy goes on, on table Y or he could go on table X. So if we do that, if we add these up, that guy's 10, that guy's 10. So we add them up. There are 20 ways in which we can arrange. Okay. All right. I hope that makes sense, guys. As I say, I think these things are quite difficult, but I hope that the explanation is, uh, is coherent and rational to you. Break it down, I think, if you can. Uh, it gives you the best chance of success. Okay, then. Here we are in part B of this question. Let's read that out. So when the friends arrive at the restaurant, Rajid and Sue 
now decide to sit at table X on the same side as each other. And Tan decides that he does not mind anymore at which table he sits. Well, that's very, uh, very pleasant and accommodating of Tan. Uh, we want to find the number of different seating arrangements for the eight friends. Well, let's let's start with the restriction, right? So we, we, we're told that Raj and Sue now decide to sit at table X on the same side as each other. So let's just try to think that one through. What we're saying here is that we could have like Rajid and Sue here, but then of course they could switch seats, couldn't they? So it could be uh, Sue and Rajid like that. And then the same thing on the other side of the table, right? We could have uh, Rajid and Sue, and then they could switch sides and be uh, Sue and Rajid like that. Okay, so there are basically four ways in which we could could see them now let's just um stick with um stick with the one at the top right so let's say we've got Rajid and sue up here then we've got to think how many ways could we rearrange um the guys on the other side of the table well how many people have we got to choose from uh we've got to choose six now because we can include tan because tan doesn't mind sitting at the same table and uh, we want to arrange two of those six now now in this combination it's going to be permutations why is it permutations because we're, we're saying the order matters, right? Putting one guy here and another guy there is different to reversing that order, right? And uh, and switching where they seat. So remember with um, when order matters, we're using permutations. When order doesn't matter, we're using combinations. So in the first question, part A, we're just dividing into two groups. We were saying the order didn't really matter. So we could use combinations. In this case, because the order does matter, we've got to use permutations, okay? So basically, for whichever way that Rajan and Sue decide to sit, there are going to be uh, six um, P2 ways of choosing the remaining two seats, right? So it's going to be six P2 ways of choosing those seats. And, and what we said earlier was that there are four ways in which we could arrange uh, Rajan and Sue. So we're going to have four times by six P2. Now, why are we multiplying there? Because it's the word and, right? If If we want to have two events at the same time, um, then, uh, so we want this and this, then we multiply. Because if, if you think about it this way, what we're saying is for, for each way in which we can arrange Rajid and Sue, there are six P2 ways of arranging the other people. So if we were to put Rajid and Sue here, then there would also be six P2 ways there. If we were to, to switch the order here, there would be six P2 ways there. And if we were to switch the order again, there'd be six P2 ways, right? So in other words, for each way of arranging Rajid and Sue, there are six P2 ways of arranging the others. So it's four times by six P2. Okay, well then along with that, we also want to arrange table Y. So and, we want to do table X and we want to do table Y. Now the and is also going to indicate that we're going to have another multiplication here, isn't it? Um, now how many ways can we arrange the people on table Y? Well, we've got now four people um, uh, to, uh, uh, to choose from and we're arranging them in four different places with no restrictions. So that's going to be 4P4, right? So we uh, once we've selected for table X, we've got uh, four people left remaining, and we're arranging four of them. The order is important, so it's 4P4. Now, what's the key thing here? We want to have the number of arrangements for table X and the number of arrangements for table Y, so we're going to be multiplying, right? Because, if, again, if you think about it, for each way that we could arrange table X, right, for each of these four times by 6P2 ways, there are 4P4 ways of arranging table Y. So we've got to multiply all these guys, okay? So we end up with... Uh, 4 times by 6p2 times by uh, 4p4, okay? So if I was to calculate that, so 4 times by uh, 6p2, is that right? Times by 4p4. So I think now the best thing for me to do is I've just got to input all of that into my calculator. Let me just get that out. So 6p2, 6p2, that's 30. So we've got 4 times by 30. And then we've got 4p4, which is the same as 4 factorial, okay, is 24. So we've got 4 times by 30 times by 24. So let me just do that. And that gives me 2,880. And let's check that that is the right answer. Just open that up. Bit of nervousness there. Yes, 2880 is the right answer. Okay, then here we are in the last part of, uh, of this question. As they leave the restaurant, the eight friends stand in a line for a photograph, find a number of different arrangements if Rajid and Sue stand next to each other, but neither is at the end of the line. Okay, I think the best thing to do here is we just draw it out, right? We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight um, 
uh, places in the line. And uh, basically, uh, Rajid and Sue can't occupy the ends, right? So the ends, if we just think about those, we'll, we'll kind of divide them off, right? So we're not, Rajid and Sue can't go there. Um, how many people could go in the first slot? Well, we've got eight friends. We can't choose uh, Rajid and Sue, so we can't choose two. So there are six people that could go in the first slot. And if there are six people that can go in the first slot, then once we've chosen one, there'll be five people who could go in the second slot, okay? Now, if you prefer to think about it a slightly different way, what you could say is, uh, we've got six people to choose from, and we're arranging them in two slots. And that would be 6P2. And uh, 6P2 is the same thing as six times by five, right? If, if you're not sure about that, just type into your calculator. 6P2 is, um, is 30, and six times by five is 30, right? So. For the people at the ends, the number of ways we can arrange them is 6 times by 5, or 6p2. So now let's think about the guys in the middle. Well, we're going to treat Rajid and Sue as being um, one item, right? And so then if we think about them as one item, well, how many ways um, can we arrange them in the line? Well, we've got one item here, two, three, four, five items. So how many ways can we arrange five items? That's 5p5 or, or just 5 factorial. Okay, so we've got five factorial uh, ways of arranging the items in the middle. But remember, Rajid and Sue, right? They can also be rearranged internally. And the number of ways we can do that is two factorial or just two. Um, because if you think about it, right, we can either have Rajid and Sue or the other way around, Sue and Rajid. So if I multiply that all out, I'm going to get five factorial uh, times by uh, six times by five and times by two. And that gives me 7,200 which uh, which is the answer, okay? Um, but I think it may be good if we can think about it another way, all right? So I think with these questions, you want to train yourself to try to do them at least three or four different ways. Um, that way you can kind of verify your answer and you get a bit more confident. The way I'm going to do it the second way is I'm going to say, just keep Rajid and Sue out of the picture. We're now going to arrange uh, the six remaining friends. How many ways can we arrange six remaining friends? Well, that's going to be six factorial, right? Now then, where can Rajid and Sue go? They could go here, 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 and here. Where they can't go is they can't go there, and they can't go there because that's the end of the line. So how many um, options do we have for placing them? That's just five. Now notice it's not five factorial, right? Because we're not arranging five items. What we've got is we've got kind of one item, which is Rajid and Sue, and it can go in five different slots. So that, that's just five. So you want to think to yourself, how many ways can I place these guys? Well, they can either go here, or here, or here, or here, or here. So that's five ways. And then inside Rajid and Sue, we can rearrange them two ways, right? Because we can either have Sue and Rajid or Rajid and Sue. So what we're going to end up with is 6 factorial times by 5 times by 2. And I hope that gives us 7,200. It does give us 7,200, which is the same answer. Okay, guys, so I think um, try to try to have two, two ways of thinking it through at least. There are other ways we could do it too, um, but I think that's going to be going to be the best way for, for you to progress. Okay. All right, guys. Um, if you found these videos helpful, if, um, uh, if, if you've liked them, please do like the video, subscribe to the channel. Uh, you can leave comments below and I'll try to answer um, as we go along. And I wish you good luck with your upcoming exams.